From Parade Magazine comes a story of a self-made multimillionaire. His name was Eugene Ladd, or Land, and he greatly changed the lives of a sixth grade class in East Harlem. He had been asked to come and speak to a class of 59 sixth graders. He didn't know what he could say to them, but he was there to encourage them to complete their education and make it all the way through high school. He wondered how he could get these predominantly black and Puerto Rican children to even look at him, let alone listen. So he stood up in front of the, the group and he said, stay in school and I will help pay the college tuition for every one of you. At that moment, the lives of those students changed. For the first time, they had hope. One student said, I had something to look forward to, something waiting for me. It was a golden feeling. And the result of that speech, nearly 90% of that class went on to graduate from high school. That's what hope does in the life of a person. The people of Israel were promised by God that a Messiah would come, that he was going to deliver his people, that he was going to establish his kingdom, that he would rule the world from his throne in Jerusalem. And that hope carried the people of Israel through even the darkest of the days of the nation's life because they believed the Messiah was going to come. Now the Messiah came, but they rejected their Messiah because he didn't fit into their understanding of what a Messiah was going to do. But the promise of a Messiah who would rule the world from Jerusalem is still a promise that God is going to fulfill. God will fulfill that promise when Jesus comes back to the earth. And we call that the second coming. But after the Jews rejected their king and crucified him, God began a brand new work. He raised up a new people. These people are called the church. That's you and me. And God has promised the church that Jesus is going to come one day and return, not to the earth, but in the air. And he's going to call his church out of the world, and those who follow Jesus will go home to be with him, to live in his Father's house. And they will be with him forever. This event is called the Blessed Hope. Sometimes it's referred to as the rapture. In Titus chapter 2, it says, we're to be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, you and I, uh, we who follow Christ are to be looking for the blessed hope. We're to be living with a sense that Jesus is going to return for us and could return at any moment. Then after the church is in heaven, God will begin again to prepare the world for his second coming to the earth where he will establish his kingdom and reign and we, the church who have been in heaven with him, will come back and reign with him on the earth. So I want us to look at the blessed hope this morning. Now let me give you a definition of hope. The world says hope is a fond wish or a desire. But biblical hope is a deep, settled confidence that God will keep his promises. Biblical hope is confident expectation. Now, none of us know what tomorrow is going to hold. 
could hold death and disease, disaster, sorrow, pain, hardship, or it could hold blessing and joy and happiness. We don't know. But when I read the scriptures, what I do know is this. Tomorrow might bring Jesus. That's what Paul says, looking for the blessed hope and that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The hope that we have as believers is wrapped up in the coming of Jesus in the air. A shout from an archangel, the trumpet blasting, and the church rising up to meet Jesus and going back to be with the Father. And I want to examine with you areas of life that are wrapped up in that blessed hope, okay? And the first one is we have hope in a resurrection. <clears throat> the Christians who lived in Thessalonica had been taught by Paul about the coming of the Lord. At the time Paul was teaching them, Paul personally believed that the Lord was coming so soon that he would be alive when the Lord Jesus came back for the church. And so Christians in the church believed that Jesus was coming in their lifetime. But some of their loved ones died, and the Lord hadn't returned. And so they were fearful that because their loved ones had died, that their loved ones would miss out on the coming of Jesus, they would miss out on that blessed hope. They actually thought that their loved ones who died were buried and were gone forever. I need you to hear this passage again from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Listen to it again. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. In the text that we just read, it talks about the dead being asleep. It's a euphemism for death. Their bodies are asleep in death. If you have an NIV, it literally puts those words in death. They just add it so you understand that the people aren't literally sleeping, but they're asleep in death. But their spirits are alive in the presence of the Lord. And we have a cemetery out there, and it's full of bodies. The people that are buried there are dead. But God says their bodies are asleep. But their spirit is alive. You say, where? Well, their spirit's alive in heaven. How do we know that their spirit's alive in heaven? Well, listen to 1 Thessalonians 4.14. We already read it. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So what Paul tells us is that when Jesus returns to take us home to heaven, he will bring with him those Christians who died. So if they're coming back with him. They need to be with him ahead of time. So I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to answer the question, okay? Where are their bodies? In a cemetery, in a grave, right. So what does Jesus bring with him when he comes back? Their soul, their spirit, okay? Okay? 2 Corinthians 5.8 says this, 
To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So another question, go ahead and answer. What leaves the body when the body dies? The spirit, the soul. Where does the spirit and soul go? To heaven and to the presence of the Lord, okay? So the spirit is in heaven, the body is in the grave. Listen to how Paul puts it in Philippians. Now, I only gave you a verse. I'm going to read for you four verses. I eagerly expect... Oh, Paul is... Oh, sorry, I'm going to start here. Paul is staring death in the face. He believes he's about to be executed. And he says this, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. What Paul is saying very clearly is this. When my body dies, I, my soul, my spirit, immediately enters into heaven and is with the Lord fully alive And for the believer, that is far better. So Paul says to the Thessalonians, don't worry about your loved ones. Their spirits are already in heaven and ready to return when Jesus comes back to the earth. Now I want you to remember, the Thessalonians were afraid for their loved ones. Paul tells them not to worry. When Jesus returns to take his family home to heaven, those who have trusted in Jesus Christ but died before Jesus' return, Jesus will return to the air with their spirits in tow. Okay, they're going to be coming back with him. Then their bodies will be raised up into the air and their spirits and bodies will join together and they will be whole body soul, and spirit. Verse 15. According to the Lord's word, I tell you, that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. So the Lord descends from heaven. The spirits of those who have died are coming with him. He enters our atmosphere, the trumpet sounds, the angel shouts. Those who have trusted Jesus but have died, their bodies are raised up from the grave. They're joined with their spirit. And then those of us who know Jesus as Savior, who have not died, we will be caught up in the air to be with the Lord forever. So the point is that no follower of Christ will be left behind or lost whether they have died or whether they are alive at this moment, at this time, in this experience. No one who knows Christ will be left behind. Now let's take a look at the hope of the rapture. In verse 17, it says this. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. The word caught up literally means to snatch away, to seize by force, And that Greek word was translated into the Latin language. And the Latin word for caught up is the word rapturo. And that is the word we get rapture from. 
And that's why we call this event, this blessed hope, that's why we call it a rapture. God is going to just catch us up. He's going to seize us out of the world. It's going to be in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. So when Jesus comes back to take his family home, we will suddenly, he will suddenly remove all Christ followers from the earth. One moment, we're going to be living life as normal. And the very next moment, we're going to be with him in the air, headed back to the Father's house. I want you to listen to how Paul puts this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, which means we will not all die, okay? But we will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. That's the resurrection. And we will be changed. That's the rapture. In the same verse, he talks about the resurrection and the rapture. Jesus is speaking. In Matthew chapter 24, and I think I only gave you a couple verses, but I'm going to read for you five or six. But about the day or the hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Well, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, and the other will be left. As in Noah's day, even though there was this big ark being built, ready to be occupied, people were going about life as usual. Then the flood came and swept them all away. It happened suddenly. So when Jesus comes for his church, life will be going on as usual. And then, as Jesus pictures it, two will be in the field, one will disappear, the other will be left behind. Two women will be grinding, one will vanish, the other will be left behind. What Jesus is saying is, is when he comes, he will come suddenly, like a thief in the night. And he will snatch out of this world every person who has trusted in Jesus since the time of the cross, until he comes. Whether or not they have died and are buried, or whether or not they're walking on the earth at that very time. Now, this is a very selective group of people. Jesus isn't coming to resurrect and rapture everybody. He's only coming to resurrect and rapture those who have been saved by his grace since the time of the cross. We're called the church. Now, many people in the church... Many people who go to church, many people who consider themselves Christians, will not make the trip. Listen to what Matthew chapter 7 says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Now, you say, well, who's he talking to there? He's talking to religious leaders. He's talking to pastors. He's talking to preachers, to evangelists, to missionaries, to apostles and prophets. 
And he's saying there are numerous ministers who will not go to heaven. They're false teachers, they're false prophets, they're false ministers. Literally, they're ministers of Satan. Planted by Satan in church congregations to lead people astray. So that when judgment comes, most, if not all, of the congregation will end up going to hell. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says they preach another Jesus, but they use his name. They preach about a different spirit, but not the true Holy Spirit. They preach another gospel, but not the gospel that's preached by Peter and Paul and the apostles. In 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen to 15, this is what Paul says about them. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Now, you're sitting here and you say, well, they preached another gospel. Is there any way to simplify the gospel, the true gospel, so that we all know exactly what the gospel is? Well, there is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 7, Paul gives us the simplest form of the gospel. And I don't know how many verses I gave you, but just listen to me until I get to your verses, okay? By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. Here's the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now that's the gospel. Now he goes on and says this, and that He appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and after that He appeared to more than 500 of His brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of them were still living though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. So he gives a whole list of people who saw Jesus after he had died and had risen again so that people could go out and say, did you really see this Jesus who was crucified? You know, did you see him alive? And they would be able to verify that. Now here is the gospel Paul preached. Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. So whatever Scripture says about Christ's death on the cross, Jesus died for our sins, according to the Scripture. He was buried, therefore He was dead. And He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. And what the Scriptures teach about His resurrection is the Gospel. Then He listed people who saw Him alive after He had died. And that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. If you go back to Acts chapter 2, and you don't have to turn to it, and I'm not going to read the verses because the sermon that Peter preached, we don't have time to read it this morning. But Peter preached the first sermon after Jesus had died and risen from the grave. He started off by talking about the miracle-working Jesus that walked on the earth and how they rejected him and crucified him, crucified, put to death by nailing him to a cross. God then raised him up from the dead, and Jesus ascended into heaven, and God made him both Lord and Christ. So the gospel is very clear here. Jesus died for their sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. And in the book of Acts, the crowd, after hearing that, was cut to the heart and said to Peter, what do we need to do? 
And he said, repent and be baptized. Now listen, they needed to repent. Now repent means to turn and go in another direction. It means to change your mind about something, okay? These people needed to change their mind about Jesus. They had crucified him about a month and a half previously. They had said, we have no king but Caesar. They did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They did not believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah. They did not believe he was the anointed one. They didn't believe he was their king. Some felt that he was a lunatic. Now they needed to change their mind and believe that he is the Lord God and promised king. And they shouldn't have any problem doing that since they saw him die on a cross, they saw him buried in the ground, and now they have proof positive that he's alive and well in bodily form. They should have gone, whoa, only God can do that. He must be our king. And then they chose to follow him. You say, well, it says be baptized too. You have to understand something about baptism. When a person decided to follow John, the, the disciple that went out there and preached that Jesus was coming, people got baptized. And they were saying we're followers of John. When people decided to leave the Gentile world and become Jewish, they went through a whole bunch of rituals, but one of the rituals that they would get baptized and they were saying, we're going to be Jewish. We're going to follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When a person gets baptized, they're saying, I'm choosing to follow Jesus. They're identifying themselves with Jesus. The baptism doesn't save them. It simply identifies them with Jesus Christ. So you've got to repent and then there needs to be an evidence that you believe, and that evidence is that you follow Jesus. That's the simplest form of the gospel you can get. Now, the rapture is a serious event, gang, because only those who believe and follow Jesus are going to be caught up in the air and the remaining billions and billions and billions of people who are left behind will suffer through the tribulation that's described for us in Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 19. But everyone who believes in Jesus as the Son of God and as the Savior, as the Anointed One, as the King, has made a commitment to follow Him, they're going to be raptured out and taken to heaven. We also have a hope of rejoicing. You know, um, it says we're going to meet our loved ones in the air, verse 17. We will be caught up together with them. Billions of people have trusted in Jesus already, and they have died, and their spirits are in heaven. They're going to be coming back with Jesus. Their bodies will be resurrected and joined with their spirit and soul. Then we who are alive are going to join them in the air, and we're going to go back to heaven. As I was putting this together, I said, at that very moment, I will see my mom, mom and pop up, my nana and my granddad, my uncles and aunts, my cousins, Jeanette's mom and dad, there's going to be such a reunion that's going to take place. Maybe you've lost a husband. Maybe you've lost a child. Maybe you've lost a family member. On that day, there will be, begin a grand reunion that will last for eternity. There's going to be great rejoicing in that. But we'll also meet the Lord. 
And so we will be with the Lord, and then we'll be with him forever. While it excites me to see my loved ones again, what really makes me want that day to come soon is I'm going to get to see Jesus. I'm going to get to see the one who loved me more than he loved his own life. I'm going to see the one who died for me. But I'm not going to just see a man that looks just like a man. I am going to see him in all of his glory, like when he stood on the mountain of transfiguration and the deity burst through from his clothing. I'm going to see Jesus in all of his glory. Somebody said to me once, well, how are you going to tell the difference between Jesus and all the angels? No problem. He's coming in the air. He's the Lord of glory. And you and I are going to see Jesus face to face. I hope you're looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. A song, as I was putting the sermon together, a song ran through my mind. I haven't sung it in 30 years. Oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me. When by his grace I shall look in his face, that will be glory, glory for me. It's a fulfillment of John 14. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Revelation 22.4 says, And they will see his face. And his name will be on their forehead. Gang, we have confidence that those who died knowing Christ before the rapture, their bodies are going to be resurrected, joined with their spirit and soul, and they're going to be whole. We have confidence that if we're alive when Jesus comes in the air, that our loved ones will be with him, and then, bam, we're going to be with them and with Christ called the rapture, we have confidence that we're going to have a grand reunion with those that have gone on before us that love Jesus, and we're going to have a grand reunion, really, first time I've ever seen him, see Jesus. That is our tremendous hope and confidence that we have in Jesus Christ. This hope, of a resurrection and a rapture should give us tremendous motivation to live our lives fully for Jesus. There was a school in a large city that had a program that sent teachers into hospitals so that while the child was in long-term recovery, they wouldn't fall behind on their schoolwork. One day a teacher was assigned to visit a particular child. The teacher was sent to see this boy and she was unprepared for how badly burned the child was and how much pain he was in. But she came and told him that she was sent there to help him with his nouns and his adverbs. When she left, she felt like she had accomplished absolutely nothing. The next day she returned and the nurse said to her, What did you do to that boy? And the teacher felt like she had done something wrong, and she began to apologize. And the nurse said, no, no, you don't understand. We've been worried about this boy, but since yesterday, his whole attitude has changed. He's fighting back. He's responding to treatment. It's like he decided to live. Two weeks later, the boy explained that he had completely given up hope until that teacher came. And then he said, everything changed. And this is the quote. He said, 
They wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs with a dying child, would they? Hope changes everything. And you and I have the greatest hope in all the world. It's a blessed hope. Hopefully it's all of ours. Let's pray together. Lord, what confidence we have in you and your promises. None of your promises have ever failed, nor will they fail. You promise the followers of Christ that if we physically die, that our spirits are immediately with Jesus in heaven, fully alive, and you promise us that The resurrection is going to take place and the body is coming out of the grave and it's going to be joined to the Spirit and we're going to be whole. By some chance, some of us are still alive when Jesus Christ comes back. You promise us that we'll be caught up in the air in the cloud of angels and we'll be with the Lord forever and with those that have been raised from the dead and we praise you for that. And I pray, Lord, that if there's someone here this morning who hasn't yet Change their mind. Change their mind about who Jesus is. Change their mind about doing life their own way. That they'll come to you and say, Jesus, I do believe you died for my sins. I do believe you were buried and I do believe you rose again. Therefore, I believe you are the Son of God and my King, my Lord, my Savior. I will choose to follow you today. I don't want to be left behind. I want to be with you forever in heaven. May today be the day that they come to know you, indwelt by your Holy Spirit and changed from the inside out. Thank you, Lord, for how you're going to work in our lives. Motivate us with this truth, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.